Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. The Key of Truth is a fascinating book, written by a sect of Armenian Unitarian Christians in the 1700s. Originally under Muslim control, this group of Christians migrated to Russian-controlled Armenia in the 19th century. Sadly, they faced investigation, persecution, fines, and probably exile at the hands of the Armenian church authorities. Although lost to history, this group of 25 families lives on in their intriguing and bold surviving text, The Key of Truth. Translated into English by Frederick Cornwallis Connie Bear, this book testifies to a biblical Unitarian community trying to survive in a hostile environment. This is the presentation I gave at the Unitarian Christian Alliance Conference of 2022, and I have a paper that accompanies this presentation, which is available at restitutio.org under Articles, so you can check that out there. I also have the entire text of the Key of Truth on restitutio.org under articles as well if you are interested in reading this document for yourself. Here now is episode 505, The Key of Truth, a monument of Armenian Unitarianism. Pastor Sean Finnegan serves as the lead pastor of Living Hope Community Church near Albany, New York, and serves as the president of Living Hope International Ministries, a network of churches and home fellowships dedicated to making disciples of all nations. Pastor Finnegan is also the host of Restitutio, a weekly podcast focused on restoring authentic Christianity and living it out today. He holds a Master's of Theological Studies in Early Christian History from Boston University, a bachelor's in theology from Atlanta Bible College, and a bachelor's in computer engineering. Finnegan also serves as an adjunct professor at Atlanta Bible College and is the author of many articles on issues of Christian theology and biblical studies, and he currently sits on the volunteer board of the Unitarian Christian Alliance and lives with his family in New York. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Sean Finnegan. Well, good morning. I'm so honored to speak with you today and discuss an important discovery that I've made. Church history can sometimes be a little dull, can be a lot of reading, but sometimes you find something and you're just so excited about it. And that's how I feel this morning. In 1837, the Armenian Orthodox authorities became aware of a group of sectarian Armenians who migrated from Ottoman-controlled territory in 1828 to Russian-speaking Armenia. There were 25 households that made this move during the Russian-Turkish War of 1828 to 1829. They began an investigation of this group, the Armenian authorities, which lasted from 1837 to 1845. Reportedly, They were heretics who, quote, although illiterate, were brilliant preachers of their doctrine, fooling the innocent and hiding their evil sect from the clergymen and knowledgeable laymen. Sound like interesting people to me. (laughs) They focused their inquiries on the village of Arkveli, and in the course of that investigation, several people came forward with confessions. So this is an inquisition an official inquiry into a deviant group of Christians in Russian-speaking Armenia in the year starting 1837, and this investigation went all the way till 1845. I'm glad we are not in a time and a place where we are vulnerable to this kind of situation. But in the course of that investigation, which went on, like I said, for eight years, Several people came forward with confessions. And so I want to read to you a little bit of their, these confessions. These are, these are turncoats. These are people who said, I no longer want to be associated with this community. I'm going to go back to the, to the mainstream Armenian church. And uh, this is a little bit of what they said. 
in their confessions. They say, this is someone named Carapet who says, they convinced me, they the sect that's under investigation, that Christ is not God, made me blaspheme the cross as being nothing, told me that the baptism and holy oil of the Armenians is false, and that we must rebaptize all of us on whose foreheads the sacred oil of the wild beast is laid. That's a great line. The mother of God is not believed to be a virgin, but to have lost her virginity. We reject her intercession, and also whatever saints there be, reject their intercession. Then he goes on. The canon lore of the holy patriarchs they reject, and say that the councils of the patriarchs were false, and that their canons were written by the devil. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Confession number two. In 1837, in February, during Shrovetide, on the first of the week, in the chamber of Grigor Kauswan, I saw Tharzi Sargis reading the gospel. First he read it, and then explained it. He told us not to worship things made with hands, that is to say, images of saints and the cross, because these are made of silver and are the same as idols. Christ is the Son of God, but was born a man of Mary. After suffering, being buried, and rising again, he ascended into heaven and sat on the right hand of the Father and is our intercessor. Except Christ, we have no other intercessor. For the mother of God, they do not believe to be a virgin, nor do they admit the intercession of saints. When you go into church, pray only to God and do not adore pictures. Last of all, they told me that Christ is not God, and then I understood the falsity of their faith. This is Confession 2 by Manic. And then Confession 3 by Avos is, they say, Christ is not God, but the Son of God in our intercessor, sitting on the right hand of God. You shall know Christ alone and the Father, and all the saints which are or have been on the earth are false. There is no need to go on vows to Etchmiatsin or Jerusalem. Etchmiatsin is the main spiritual center in Armenia. You shall confess your sins in church before God alone. You shall always go to church. This is to the big church that's run by the government authorities in Armenia, even to this day. Just like many other Eastern European countries, you have the Eastern Orthodox Church. So you have the Armenian State Church, or as they call themselves, the Armenian Apostolic Church. Very similar to the feel of a Catholic Church or Greek Orthodox Church in the sense of the liturgy and the way they have images and, and so on and so forth. And so what they're saying is you should go to church to that church. And to the priests at the time of confession, you shall not tell your sins, for they do not understand. But talk to them in a general sort of way. Always go to church. Not that our kind considers it real, but externally, you shall perform everything and keep yourselves concealed until we find an opportunity. And then, if we can, we will all return to this faith of ours. And we swear, even if they cut us to pieces, that we will not reveal it. This is a persecuted community. That's what you're seeing here. This is eyewitness testimony of people who were part of a, a persecuted community that is terrified of being uh, beaten, fined, executed, exiled, whatever kind of threats may come their way. They had lived in Muslim-controlled Ottoman Empire. During a war, they escaped to the north to Russian-controlled territory. But now, instead of the Muslims being the ones who are going to persecute them, it's the Armenian official Christians that they're much more worried about now than the Muslims. In the course of this investigation, in the year 1838, the authorities came across a document called the Key of Truth. It's an obscure document, and they confiscated it and impounded it, transferring it to Etchmiatsin. The author was Johannes Vahaguni, or just, I call him John. It's a little easier. Date of publication was 1782. It is true that in 1898, a scholar named Connie Bear, and then in 1967, another scholar named Garsoyan made a case that it's actually much older, that it's a medieval document, but that has failed to stand up to scrutiny over time. And if you would like to know all the nitty gritty details of why I think the key of truth is from 1782 instead of 782. You can read the paper that goes with this presentation. 
And you can also find that on my website, restitutio.org, under articles. So the Key of Truth is an 18th century document. There's only one manuscript that survives. Think about that for a moment. There's one book, there's one manuscript on the planet that we know of, written in the Armenian language. There's 149 pages in it, and over 30 pages are missing, torn out of the manuscript. Even worse, there are many erasures of a word or a phrase, though most of them are recoverable. So it's a mutilated, damaged, only manuscript that survives. And it was translated into English in 1898 by Frederick Connie Bear. And it's a fascinating book, a fascinating book to read. So I want to tell you all about this book. I want to tell you like, about their, their beliefs about God in particular. But then I want to share with you some of the other beliefs that they had that you might be interested in. And then if you want to know more, you can just read it yourself. You can get it online for free. God bless the 21st century, right? <laughs> so the key of truth is not a systematic theology. It's a composite document containing a treatise on Jesus' baptism, admonitions about Satan, detailed instructions on repentance, baptism, and communion, a liturgy for ordination, and it ends with a catechism. It's thoroughly biblical. There are lots of quotations from the Bible. Not too much from the Old Testament, though. Just uh, there's, I only found one quotation from Genesis, maybe a couple of allusions to Old Testament figures, but lots from the New Testament. Uh, especially the Gospels and Paul's epistles, lots of that. But also Hebrews, 1 Peter, and 1 John are all quoted in this, in this book. And again, we don't have the whole thing. So I think if we had the whole thing, we'd have even a better sense of what parts of the Bible that really spoke to them. And it has a clear Unitarian theology in the Key of Truth document. So this is the book that this community of Armenian Unitarians produced. So this is from chapter 14 of the Key of Truth. It says, No one can remit sins save only the one God. Huh. But do you investigate all their other words and give praise to the Heavenly Father and to His only born Son? Chapter 19. If you listen unto the church, the infinite God shall save you. The head of all is the Lord Jesus, whom the Holy Paul doth confess, and the head of Christ is God and light. Chapter 20, we confess and believe that there is one true God of whom our Lord Christ speaketh. John 17, 3, this is life eternal that they should know thee, the only true God, and him thou didst send, Jesus Christ. Again, we confess and believe in Jesus Christ, a new creature and not creator, as St. Paul saith to the Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 2, he is faithful to his creator as was Moses and all his house. The part that's in brackets here, it says a new creature and not, that's a part that's been erased from the manuscript, and the translator was able to recover what was there in the original. Okay, and these are not like contested or controversial, these recoveries. They were fairly poorly scraped, so you can still make out many of them. Not all of them, but many of them. So he, he puts those in square brackets when he's reconstructed it. Look at that, a new creature. To call Christ an old creature even, that's quite a statement, but a new creature even more so. This verse here at Hebrews 3, 2, where it says, he is faithful to his creator. Uh, most of our English translations, maybe all, are going to say appointed, that he is faithful to him who appointed him, as was Moses. But it's actually the Greek word for maker. And so this word can do a couple different things. And this community is reading it as creator, which is a very strong reading for Hebrews 3, 2. But it would really make your point very clear. A lot of scholars who have studied this book, The Key of Truth, have alleged that this community, this author and the community he represented, held to an adoptionist Christology. So what I want to do is show you a number of quotations of scholars from 1898 to 2016 that say this about them. And then I'll explain what adoptionism means. So this is Frederick Connie Bear in 1898. He says, For the key of truth contains the baptismal service and ordinal of the adoptionist church, almost in the form in which Theodotus of Rome may have celebrated those rites. So again, he's calling the key of truth the adoptionist church. Leon Arpey in 1906 said, The Christology of the key is unitarian of the adoptionist type. He was born the new Adam 
and he was without either original or actual sin. As a man, he lived for 30 years. At the beginning of his public ministry, he was led by the Spirit to seek baptism at the hand of John. And when he was baptized, he saw the Spirit descend upon himself and heard the voice, This is my beloved Son. To him, that was the hour of his adoption. Born a man, he was then adopted to be the Son of God. That's what Leon Arpey said. In 1967, a powerhouse scholar named Nina Garsoyan wrote, Jesus does not seem to have been born the Son of God, but rather to have been recognized by the Father as a reward for the virtuousness of his life and quality of his faith. The recognition of Jesus as Son of God came only at his baptism, which was the most important sacrament. Charles Vertanis in 1985. As adoptionists, they rejected the Trinity. They refused to regard Christ as the eternal co-equal of God the Father, but considered him a creature who obtained his title as the Son of God by virtue of his obedience to the will of God. So you're getting what an adoptionist is, right? It's somebody's born a human being with normal parents, biological father, biological mother, but they're really good at righteousness. And so this person then God adopts as his son. That's the idea of adoptionism. Janet and Bernard Hamilton in 1998 wrote, For the key of truth held an adoptionist, not a docetic Christology. That is to say, they believe that Jesus was a man who at his baptism was adopted by God as his son. That's a good quick definition for you. Anna Ohanjanyan in 2013, a real specialist on the key of truth, although sadly her dissertation is locked away in the Armenian language. But she did a conference presentation in English. And so we have some access to her in the English-speaking world. She wrote, The doctrine of the key of truth displays the elements of adoptionism when it comes to Christology, as Christ is considered to be an adopted son of God. The adoptionistic and Unitarian, anti-Trinitarian, or more specifically Neo-Aryan viewpoints combined with widely known theological or even biblical postulates. That's just like another way of saying she doesn't really know what they believe. Uh, you know, like these, these are not compatible ideas, but we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. Muslim scholar Abd el-Raham Tayara in 2016 wrote, when it comes to the father-son relationship, Paulician views can be characterized according to the key of truth as adoptionist. Specifically, they believe that Jesus became the son of God only after he successfully passed through various stages of maturity and experiences, the first of which was baptism. All right, so I've just showed you seven sources from 1898 to 2016, all of which say this document, this book, is an adoptionist document. And I am convinced they're all wrong. I am 100%, oh, I mean, I don't know if you can be 100%, 99.9% convinced that every one of these scholars that I just read to you, and these are real scholars, these are people that know what they're talking about, that they're mistaken on this particular point. But if there's smoke, there's a fire, right? So why do they all say, oh, the key of truth is adoptionist? Why is it adoptionist? Well, there's this one section of chapter two of the key of truth that they read, and they're like, that's got to be adoptionism. So I want to read this section to you. This is the adoptionist section of the key of truth, or the section that people think is adoptionist. And I want to read it carefully with you and show you why I don't think this says that this group of Unitarian Arminians was adoptionist. Because you know what? The problem with being labeled an adoptionist is we could just dismiss you now. Because guess what? Luke says that Mary was a virgin when she conceived. And you're disagreeing with Luke, you know, or Matthew says about the virgin birth. So it's, it's a way to say, well, you're not really a Christian. You're an adoptionist. You're one of these people over here. It's a, it's a marginalizing tactic. Not that these scholars are necessarily doing it for that purpose, but that is the function of the label. So I'm here to defend the Armenian Unitarians against these, <laughs> these claims, these accusations. Uh, so this is the passage that I want to read. It's from chapter 2. It's a little bit lengthy, and it's talking about the baptism of Jesus. It says, First was our Lord Jesus Christ baptized by the command of the Heavenly Father when 30 years old. Then it was that he received authority, received the high priesthood, received the kingdom, and office of chief shepherd. Moreover, he was then, at his baptism, chosen 
Then he won lordship. Then he became resplendent. Then he was strengthened. Then he was revered. Then was he appointed to guard us. Then was he glorified. Then he was praised. Then he was made glad. Then he shone forth. Then he was pleased. And then he rejoiced. Nay, more. It was then he became chief of beings, heavenly and earthly. Then he became light of the world. Then he became the way, the truth, and the life. Then he became the door of heaven. Then he became the rock impregnable at the gate of hell. I mean, this guy could preach, right? Then he became the foundation of our faith. Then he became savior of sinners. Then he was filled with the Godhead. Then he was sealed, then anointed. Then he was called by the voice. Then he became the loved one. Then he came to be guarded by angels than to be the lamb without blemish. Furthermore, he then put on that primal raiment of light, which Adam lost in the garden. Then, accordingly, it was that he was invited by the Spirit of God to converse with the Heavenly Father. Yea, then also he was ordained king of beings in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and also in all else besides all this is due order the Father gave to his only born Son even as he himself being appointed our mediator and intercessor, saith to his holy, universal, and apostolic church. So the key's view of Jesus' baptism is quite elevated. The baptism of Jesus was a really huge event in the way that they're thinking about who Jesus is. They really believe that, you know, we, I think a lot of us would say that that's when he received the Spirit or that's when he was anointed or something along those lines, we probably wouldn't go this far with it. But what I want to point out is that although he got all these appellations and privileges, still these were all given to the only born son. Did you catch that? It doesn't say, did you see the word adopted in here? You can search the key of truth for the A word. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find adoption, adoptionistic, adoptionism, adopt, none of it. It's just not there. Yes, they emphasized his baptism as being a significant event in his life. Yes, they threw everything and the kitchen sink into this paragraph. But that's just what good preachers do, right? (laughs) That's just what's going on here. But all this in due order the father gave to his only born son. He's a born son. He's not an adopted son. You know the difference, right? That makes sense. So, I don't think this passage, which is the single passage they're all pointing to to say the key of truth is adoptionistic, I don't think it really says that if you read it carefully. Now this phrase, the only born son, as it turns out, shows up a few other times in the document as well, in chapter 17, chapter 21, and chapter 22. And we don't need to read all of them, but it says over and over, he's the only born son, the only born, the only born, the only born. It's not really a phrase we use very much in our We say only begotten, but it's the same idea of the only born son, or at least very similar. But the reason why I'm so convinced they're not adoptionists is because of this section here. And you have to read all the way to chapter 23 to get this. Like, I'm reading it along, and I I really don't know. Are they adoptionists or are they not? I don't know these people. So I'm like, I got to page 23. I wish I could show you my book. I have it in my bag. I wrote Booyah in huge pen in the margin. It was just like, what? Let me, let me read this to you. I'm so excited. And knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son. And after eight days, do you catch that? That's a virgin conception or virgin birth there, right? Because he did not know her until that's how you have babies. If you're not known, it's okay. I don't want to go into detail. I'll just continue. And after eight days, his name was called Jesus, which name the angel Gabriel revealed in the time of her virginity. See Luke 126. For this reason, the holy evangelists and the sanctified apostles, yea, and our Lord Jesus Christ declare Mary prior to the birth to be a virgin, but after the birth call her a wife and utterly deny her virginity, as in the aforesaid, the Son of God asserts in John chapter 2. So this right here, this is how I would put it. It is impossible to believe in Gabriel's announcement that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will have a child and he will be called the Son of God. And Mary's question, how can this be? Oh, I've not been with a man. And he says, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You cannot believe in that narrative and be an adoptionist at the same time. 
You just can't. Because an adoptionist believes that Joseph's the dad, and that because he was just really a really good boy, that then God made him his own son. And I think that's a really different belief than what this community believed. For him, Jesus is the Son of God precisely because of the miracle in the womb of Mary. So I don't think these are a weirdo adoptionist sect. I think they're Unitarians, Unitarian Christians. What kind of Unitarians? I know you want to know. So let's go there. Were they Arians or Sicinians? Good question. So what's the difference? First of all, I want to complain about both titles. I don't like either. I think the word Arian is just terrible because Arius did not invent Arianism. The Sicinians did not invent Sicinianism. But let me just, <laughs> I'm just going to go with the labels because they're, they're common and say the Arian is the type that's going to believe that Jesus pre-existed. And the Sicinian is going to say that Jesus began to exist when he was conceived and then born. So the question is, which one do they believe? Well, let's look at some of the quotations from the Key of Truth. This is from chapter 4. It says, Satan slew our forefather Adam and made them and their children until our Savior Christ, his slaves and captives, and fastened them in his chains and so forth. And so in bonds until the advent of the newly created Adam kept them. So this is a phrase they use, the newly created Adam. And that's how they talk about Christ. And so it was that it pleased the Heavenly Father in pity to create the new Adam out of the same deceitful blood. So they believe that Jesus is made from the blood of the human race. It's a deceitful blood because it's been corrupted in some sense from the fall and from Satan's deception of Eve. So th th that's what they're talking about here. They're saying that there is this new Adam, and the new Adam did not come into existence in ages past, but in more recent times. And they use the word new to accomplish that communication. But the created man, Jesus, knew his father, and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, came to St. John in all gentleness and humility to be baptized by him. Chapter 23, thus previously to Mary's bearing the new created Adam. So that's pretty clear, right? <laughs> So she bore the new created Adam. Gabriel, the archangel, pronounces her a virgin and greets her. But after the birth, the same angel does not call her a virgin. On the point of preexistence, first of all, there's no mention of preexistence in the key of truth. You can read it for yourself. You can investigate any of this yourself. Secondly, the standard way of talking about Jesus is that he's newly created. So that tells me that he's a recent creation as opposed to someone who existed in times past in like the Old Testament times and so forth. Uh, now I want to look at a little bit more about these people because their belief in who God is is not the only interesting thing about them and their way of talking about Jesus. They also have some other what I would call Protestant beliefs that are very out of place. Imagine yourself living in the 1700s in a Muslim controlled area and then in the 1800s in a what we would call probably orthodox type environment. I mean, they, they the Armenian church is not technically orthodox, but it's got the same feel to it. They would say, well, we were here before the orthodox. But the fact of the matter is, everybody's worshiping Mary as the virgin. Everyone's got the big icons. They're worshiping the saints, or maybe not worshiping, the, but they're praying to the saints. There's all these statues. There's all these like very liturgical high church practices. Like Even to this day in Armenia, this is the case. And this community of faith is just like, not in my Bible. Over and over, not in my Bible. I'm not doing that. It's not my Bible. You can't, I'm not, it's not here. So first thing up is restorationism. They really did believe that the church had gotten off track and that they were going back to the Bible to restore authentic Christianity. They didn't quite use those exact words. They were a little more confident, I think. Uh, they thought the door of truth had been shut by Satan and his minions and that here was John Vahaguni with the key of truth to unlock the, the truths long hidden. Uh, but it's still restorationism, however you slice it. They're very biblical. But they don't quote church fathers. They don't quote councils. They don't quote other people outside. But they quote the Bible over and over and over again. During ordination, there's, there's a, a whole service of ordination for ordaining a minister they pray for the minister and say, strengthen him and open his mind to understand the scripture. 
and to take up the cross in love. So this is kind of their mindset there. They believe in literal obedience to Jesus' commandments. When they ask the question in the catechism at the end of the book, they ask, how are we to define a Christian? I bet if we asked all of us in this room that question, we would get a lot of different answers. That's a big, vague question. And their answer was, one who knows our Lord Jesus Christ, what he is, and keeps his commandments. It's an interesting question. It kind of sounds like an Anabaptist answer. It's like, well, do you, do you actually follow Jesus? That's sort of like the, the way they're going with it. Which is very different than the mainstream church that they're existing in the shadow of and afraid of getting persecuted by. They're critical of the Armenian state church clergy. That's a very mild statement. Let me give it to you in their own words. They thought the bishops and the, author- the church authorities were proud, avaricious, liars, blind, false, vain, deniers of Christ who believed in a sham Messiah. And scholars believe that the 30 plus pages that were torn out was where they really laid into the state church and explained exactly why they were so bad and they didn't like them. Because you know, it would make sense, like, you hear, like, the authorities coming, you know they're going to go after this book. So, you, you know, you tear out the part that will get you in the most trouble, probably, you know. It's hard to say exactly what happened with a lot of this stuff, but that's the most common theory that the historians have. No worshiping icons, stones, crosses, waters, trees, fountains, incense, candles, or presenting victims, which I'll leave to you to research. It's kind of a weird practice of the Armenian church to this day. Don't need to confess your sins to the priests. You don't have to pray to saints, or you shouldn't pray to saints. Confirmation, ordaining to the priesthood, last unction, and marriage are not obligatory. They have three sacraments only, repentance, baptism, and communion. They have believer's baptism, and this is a really big part of the key of truth. This is like the drum that they beat over and over and over again. They don't think baptizing infants is good. In fact, they call it devilish. I mean, they're like really against baptizing infants because infants can't believe. They just don't have the the mental framework yet to believe or repent. So the pedobaptists, those who are baptizing infants, they believe are Satan's agents. And here's something else. This this is not like a a lukewarm group here. You know, like these guys are like 100%. This is what the Bible says. You're all wrong. And we're the true church. That's, that's where they're coming from. And you got, you got to respect that. Today, we might look at that kind of mindset and say, you're kind of a knucklehead. But like in the 1700s, when your life is on the line, you got to respect that and, and realize, wow, you know, this is, really, this is really taking a strong view. And so they believed, like the Anabaptists uh, a couple hundred years before them, they believed in evangelizing Christians. You know how offensive it is to get evangelized as somebody who's born into the state church and who like, believes their country is a Christian country? You know, Armenians believe that their country, to this day, is the very first Christian country on the planet. You don't think they're going to have a little pride about that? And you're going to say, you know, your Christianity is not legit. You're not even baptized. And they're like, what do you mean I'm not baptized? Well, let me read to you what they said. As we learn from the Lord of the universal and apostolic church, which they're talking about themselves, not the other church that claims that title. As we learned from the Lord of the universal and apostolic church, so do we proceed and we establish in perfect faith those who till then have not holy baptism, nay, nor have tasted of the body, nor drunk the holy blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, according to the word of the Lord, we must first bring them unto the faith, induce them to repent, and then Give it to them. Give what to them? Baptism. They also did not believe that Mary was a virgin after the birth of Christ. Before and leading up to the birth of Christ, she was a virgin and then not not afterwards. And they don't think that Mary is blessed above other saints. They have a strong emphasis on Satan as the agent of the fall, the temptations of Christ, and the enemy of true Christians in their own day. And they did not believe in going to purgatory And they they kind of made a big deal out of communion being not only taking the bread, but also drinking the wine. And that was scandalous in their culture. And the others did not like them doing that. All right, what about some of their other beliefs, some of their quirky beliefs, 
some of the unusual stuff. Well, first off, they had a really interesting eighth day ritual for newborns. Did, do any of you guys do that? Like on the eighth day, call the pastor over and there's like a special prayer? No? I don't see any hands going up. I, I've never heard of this. I mean, there's no reason not to, but this was something that's in there. This is how you do it. On the eighth day, you go to the child's house. They don't baptize the child, but they're going to pray for the child and do some sort of, uh, you know, religious service type thing. Then they had some unique baptismal practices. Let me see if I can mention a couple to you. The most unusual is that they did not baptize until the age of 30. Because Jesus was baptized when he was around 30 years old. And so they're really strict on that. Like, you're 29, sorry. I know you're repentant, but you don't qualify. you got to be 30 years old. Another thing they did was they had the person getting baptized bow to the feet of the one that's baptizing them. It's like a very strong sense of submission throughout the service of baptism, which is even more awkward when you realize they were naked. So <laughs> not that it was sexual, but it was just a, kind of a common practice in ancient churches to baptize naked and then get the robe after the baptism. Whereas in our modern times, people get baptized in their clothes or in a robe. But yeah, the Armenian Unitarians definitely uh, did not wear a bathing suit. They also had a unique ordination practice where they blew three times on the face of the minister being ordained, which reminds me of John. You remember that in the end of the Gospel of John where Jesus breathed on his apostles and says, receive the Spirit? So it's like, I don't know any other churches that do that, but like they were doing it. Hopefully they had a breath mint first. I don't know if they had those in the 1800s, but anyhow. They also believe the serpent spoke Armenian to Eve. I bet you believe he spoke English, Eve, right? So like, it's just, I just saw that in there. I'm like, I, I, gotta, I gotta mention that. Because it says, when the serpent said to Eve in the Armenian tongue, and I'm like, that's hysterical. And there's one really confusing prayer to the Holy Spirit. And I honestly am not sure what it means. Because it's clear that they believe the Father is the only true God. There's no question about that. I've got lots of quotes that I, could, that I have showed you and that I could show you more to that effect. It's clear they believe Jesus is subordinate to the Father. But it's not clear if they believe the Spirit has some kind of independent mind or existence of its own because usually you would not pray to the spirit unless you thought the spirit was its own person now it's also possible and this passage is really ambiguous could go either way that they thought they think the spirit is just talking about the father right as like a lot of unitarians do so uh, i'll leave that up in the air but they pray to the spirit in one place and they have a really confusing belief about original sin i couldn't quite figure out what they believed. On the one hand, they are very clear in the belief that Jesus did not have original sin, that the new Adam was just like the old Adam and that he, there was no inherited guilt or curse or anything like that. But then they also, in one place, in chapter 24, say there's no original or operative sin for newborns, that little babies that are born don't have original sin either. But then in other places, they say Jesus came because of original sin and that the patriarchs and kings were conceived in original sin. So I'm not really sure if they just think there's like a, a little grace period where you don't have it and then you get it or, you know, it waits until you sin to get original sin or how all that works out. It's not, again, it's not a systematic theology, this text. It's more of a, a handbook for how to do church and for how to ordain and for how to baptize and how to deal with babies. Right? So these are the, the kinds of things that it more focuses on. And they have kind of a limbo belief for the dead. They, they don't believe the dead are in heaven. They believe the righteous dead are in prison with the unrighteous, which has got to be crazy awkward, right? <laughs> like all stuck in this subterranean cell. Like, uh, hey, so what's your name? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Fred. You know, like, how long are you in for? You know, like, I mean, it's just such a weird idea, but that's what they believe. They're, they're waiting until final judgment, and they're not entirely clear on it, but presumably conscious, though they haven't yet received the crown of the kingdom of God. They do mention the kingdom of God a couple times, but not enough for me to really get a sense of what their belief was about it, which is sad. And then 
Here's another one that's going to blow your categories away and why I don't think you can just say they're Protestants. They believe the transformation of bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ in communion. And this is not like in, in some like sophisticated language of transubstantiation or real presence. or They don't have any of that terminology. They're just like, it changes into this. That's, not, that's just how they say it. It's very simple. This is the people. This is this group of people. We come across them. We get little, little bits and pieces about them in the 1700s when they're down there in the Ottoman Empire in what we would modern day today call Turkey. And we have little bits of information about them. And, and then they migrate up. These couple hundred people mi migrate up to Armenia, to the city of Arkweli and the surrounding areas. And they're immediately busted for being non-Orthodox according to the standards of the state church. They are investigated relentlessly. And then in 1845, after they've been arrested and questioned and they've had informants in the, these confessions I started with, there are actually six confessions they were able to get. In 1845, the authorities decided, let's just send them to the army. Let's send them to the Russian military and that'll, that'll be our way of dealing with them. But that plan actually failed on a technicality. There was, since they were already a community before a certain year and there had just been a reordering of political events through this war, they were actually given an exemption from joining the military, so they didn't do that. Instead, they fined them 45.9 rubles, uh, which is hard to say how much that really is because like, even $45 back in the year 1845 today would be $1,700. But I don't know what the what a ruble's worth, you know, in in dollars back then compared to today and so forth. So it could have been a lot of money, it could have been not that much. And then according to one source, they were then sent into exile to Siberia, which is like an alternative to the military, where you put people you don't really want to be, you know, circulating and and, and spreading something. Although, as one scholar, Ahan Janyan, points out, the deaths, she did an investigation into the death certificates in this village, and a lot of the names on death certificates were the names of the people associated with the investigation. So either they didn't all go to Siberia and some stayed behind, or many of them went to Siberia and then they were able to return later and able to die in that village. After 1845, it's hard to sort out the subsequent history of this group. I mean, we know so little about them. It's incredible that we know anything about them at all. I bet there were dozens, if not hundreds, of groups like this throughout the history of the church that we'll never know about until the last day. But we know about this one, and I think it's really cool. We do have a fascinating report from 1852 from a Baptist missionary named Josiah Peabody who wrote about this group. Uh, so I'm going to quote that to you. And... You know, some people question some of the details of what he said here, but uh, I, I don't know for sure how we would get to like another report and, and be able to verify what he said or not verify what he said. So I'm just going to give you the raw primary source and you figure out what it means. All right, so Josiah Peabody's letter in Missionary Herald, he writes, about 50 years ago, Mr. Peabody says, an Armenian priest in Canoes while traveling in Europe fell in with some Protestant Christians from whom he learned that the only rule of faith and practice was the word of God. I like it already. So this is the guy who wrote the book, The Key of Truth, is who he's talking about, just to be clear. He soon began to compare his religion with that which is set forth in the gospel. And he found, of course, that his church was full of error and corruption. He returned to his people and began to preach this new way. A terrible persecution burst upon him, not, however, till he had convinced some 15 families of the truth of the evangelical doctrines. His enemies, determined to put a stop to further progress of this heresy, practiced upon its promulgator various severities, but without success. Don't you love how they wrote in the 1800s? They finally told him that if he did not recant, his nose should be cut off. He assured them that he would submit to this barbarous treatment rather than renounce the gospel. The threat was carried into execution, but without producing the intended effect. He continued to preach the gospel so far as he was acquainted with it. His persecutors then determined to effect his death, 
to avoid which he was obliged to flee to Urzum and embrace the Muslim faith. That's how they said Muslim back in the day. And in this, it is said he died. Some of his children who are Muslims are now living in this city. At the time of the Russian invasion in 1827 to 28, it appears that 15 families, or according to other reports, 25 families, spoken of above, immigrated to Russia. But after their faith became known, they were subjected to various indignities and cruelties. Some of them were even thrown into prison, where they were kept for years. But the truth was not eradicated from their minds, and several of these families still remain in Russia, firm in the faith of their fathers. About five years since, two families returned to Canoos, where they have been exerting their influence, Mr. Peabody says, in a quiet way, till the number of families persuaded of the correctness of their faith amounts to eight, embracing 60 souls. And the trail goes cold, 1852. Where do they go after this? I have no idea. So let's review. What have we seen? Well, when the Bible's available, Unitarianism flourishes. This is a principle you see over and over again, is that you give somebody a copy of the Bible, they just come away thinking with this sense that the Father is God, and that Jesus is not equal, not eternal, not co-essential, or whatever high flutin language you want to put on it, with God, that he is subordinate to God. And something else is that so much of our history is lost. So much of our history either wasn't written down or was written down, but then it wasn't preserved by later communities who were able to copy it before the paper wore out or was confiscated by authorities and burned. If a random Oxford scholar in the 1890s didn't travel over to Ejmiatsin, Armenia, searching for something on the Paulicians, an unrelated medieval group, and find this one manuscript of the Key of Truth and say, huh, I think this will be interesting, and then convince a local Armenian scholar to make a full copy of it and send it all the way back to him in England, and then translate it into English, and then, however many years later, after the internet age came along, some industrious publisher on Amazon didn't come along and also say, you know what, I think that's a book from the 1800s we should make available today in a reprint edition. I would have no idea about this group. Do you know how many things, I mean, just think about it. This is a group that was cracked down upon by the authorities. They were arrested. They were, who knows what else happened to them, probably exiled, fined. People may have died. We don't know. And they confiscated this book, and the authorities, instead of burning it, they said, oh, let's just put this back in the home base library. I mean, there, there are so many random little coincidences that had to happen for this group's existence to come to our attention today. But I'm so thankful that they did happen so that we could say to this group, you're with us. We claim you. You are Unitarian Christians. We are Unitarian Christians, too. You belong with us. We accept you, even though they're weird on a couple of things. Because you know what? You're weird on a couple of things, too. And so am I, right? The UCA is all about this affirmation. The one God is the Father alone, and Jesus is his human Messiah, who is now exalted as Lord and Savior. This group believed that. They believed that. So I think it's time for us to claim this historical group. They're an orphan of history. Nobody's claimed them. They don't even have a name. I named them the Arminian Unitarians. That's not even a real name, come on. That's just like describing them by one of their beliefs. They don't even have a name. Their one book survived, but that's it. So I think it's time for us to claim them and say, look, you guys, you're, you're with us. Come on over, come on over, hang out with us, join our group, we love you. And who knows, maybe some of these people are still alive in Turkey or Armenia or in Siberia or some other part of Russia. Russia's in chaos again. Maybe some people will escape a border while people aren't looking. I, for one, want to say to anyone of this group who may watch this that you are welcome at the Unitarian Christian Alliance. We'd love to have you. So that's what I wanted to share about this. For more 
including the paper, and I'm going to put up a full translation, uh, the one from 1898. You can see my website, restitutio.org, under articles, and you'll be able to get it there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pastor Sean, for that fascinating and insightful historical presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, we are just going to have a couple of questions before we break for lunch. I know we're all very interested in that. Um, and I'm going to start by actually combining um, a couple of questions that we've gotten. Uh, the first question uh, was, the key of truth appears to be a very theologically developed document. Where does its content derive from? Meaning, where do the theological traditions they affirm originate? And the related, a related question is this. It was reported that the followers of Paul of Samosata, third century Unitarian Syrian bishop, fled to Armenia. Did this group have roots back to him, or possibly Socinians, or are they independent? Sorry, I just, I, I could recognize the same Tiedemann question when I get one. Um, <laughs> what was the first question? Their theological influences. That's a hard, that's a hard question to figure out, to be honest, because you can't really pigeonhole them in one group. Uh, if you want to say, well, they're Protestants, then it's like, well, why didn't they answer the question, what does it mean to be a Christian with believe in the gospel by faith alone, scripture alone? Like, where are the solas? They don't have any solas. They don't really sound like Protestants in the, the traditional sense. As, as far as, like, if they're Anabaptists, Anabaptist Unitarians are called Socinians, right? And there are Hungarian ones, there are Polish ones, there are Italian ones. To start the thing off, Socinian, it does not sound like a Polish name to me, right? Uh, so the, um, it could be that they're associated with them, but then what's all this with original sin? Socinians don't believe in original sin. So it's really hard to figure out who exactly the influence was. We do know about this guy, and there's a lot of hostile reporting about this John Vahaguni. A lot of hostile <laughs> rumors and accusations about him. But uh, it seems pretty clear that he did get out of the country and go to Venice in Italy and was, had spent time in a monastery there, an Armenian monastery there. And that's probably where he had association with other Protestant-minded people. And um, then came back home and was able to write this book and make these converts. So theologically, we don't, we don't have like a clear antecedent for them. As far as the question of Paul Samosata, who is a very, very important, also non-adoptionist, uh, Christian Unitarian, Biblical Unitarian. There is no evidence at all that links the key of truth in this Armenian community to the Paulicians. The Paulicians were a group of people that were alleged to have been followers of Paul of Samosata. But that's also probably false as well. Uh, because the way you fight heresy in the Middle Ages is you just label a group by somebody that is a bad name and then hope it sticks. So I don't think the Paulicians really had anything to do with Paul Samosata either because the Paulicians didn't believe that God created the universe. They thought an evil God created the universe and that the true God was somewhere else and wasn't even going to take charge until later on, was not like accessible. And they believed that Jesus was more of a, a docetic Christology. So he was like a, a hologram. <laughs> you know, G Jesus was a human in form, but not in reality. Right, so that's the Paulicians. So I, I don't think that's very similar to Paul of Samosata either. I argue that case in detail in the paper. And the paper's also in the app. So if you want to go to the app under this presentation, there's a, there's a PDF in there you can get. Excellent. What, if anything, uh, does this Key of Truth group teach about the Eucharist? They teach that it's really important, and they teach full participation, uh, as I mentioned. It's not just the bread, it's the bread and the wine. And what the little statement they have is, I, I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, from the catechism at the very end of the book of the Key of Truth. So if you want to find it, like go towards the end of it. And it's just a very simple statement. It's like something like the, the, the bread and the wine become the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, something like that. To slice it any finer than that, and to say, well, he's talking about real presence, or he's talking about Aristotelian transubstantiation. Like, there's just not enough data for us to recover that. But it was a big deal. It was a big deal to them. 
Did the Armenian church believe baptism is essential for salvation? If so, if there were young deaths, what was their stance of salvation for the under 30 and unbaptized? I'm going to assume that Armenian in this case means the sect of Armenian Unitarians as opposed to the, the big church. And the question is, uh, did they believe baptism was necessary for, for salvation? They never say that. They never clearly say that in the, in the book. They talk about the importance of baptism and the importance of not getting baptized until you're 30. But they do not say, if you die before you're 30, you're damned to, to judgment or something. I would hope they wouldn't believe that. But I don't really know because they don't say. Yeah, that baptism after 30 might have some bearing on their original sin beliefs as well. It could, yeah. Interesting. yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point you bring up, Keegan, because the mainline churches tend to associate infant baptism with washing away original sin. And so if you take infant baptism out, you're like, well, what do I do with this original sin stuff? Like, am I just going to stew in this? Right. Does the key of truth have any exegesis of the prologue of John? No. Short okay. answer. And the final question. I think they mention it once, but there, there's no exegesis that I recall. And the final question is, tell us how you got started in this research and what would you still like to know that you don't know? Okay, how did I get started? Uh, it was actually uh, a relative of Rebecca's. Uh, Mark Madison wrote a paper in the 90s. In it, he listed out different Unitarians throughout history. And one of them he mentioned was called the Politians, which is a medieval group in Armenia. And so I started researching them, and I came across the Key of Truth book because the guy who translated it was convinced that this book was a Politian book. It's actually in the title of his translation. And so that's what got me started on it. I read his arguments. I was like, hallelujah, there are biblical Unitarians in the Middle Ages. This is great, uh, which is what Mark had kind of like tentatively thought. He didn't go fully in, but he suggested it. And then uh, I read, I, I spent my summer vacation reading Nina Garsoyan's The Paulician Heresy from the year 1967. Brilliant Columbia scholar from Armenia, grew up in uh, France as a refugee, came to New York City, spoke a bazillion languages perfectly, you know, one of these just superstars, and uh, wrote a book that was almost impenetrable, the kind of book you have to read every sentence twice. Uh, finally got all the way through it. I was like, oh, she's so brilliant. She's, she's got to be right. I mean, she's got to be right. So then I was like totally convinced. The Politians are biblical Unitarians. The key of truth ref reflects their beliefs. And then I started looking at the other scholarship done since 1967. And it systematically and universally destroyed all of her arguments. And I was left in despair. Like, I did all this research to discover the opposite of what I hoped would be true. <laughs> so I don't think this book relates to medieval Christianity at all, uh, but I still think these people matter, and that's why I wanted to still present on this from a 17 and 1800 perspective. I think these people were courageous Christians that stuck their neck out, and they suffered for their, for their faith, but they also made lots of converts too. And so uh, that's kind of the little story of how I got into that research. Excellent. Thank you, Pastor Sean. Let's give him a round of applause one more time. Well, that brings this episode to a close. What did you think? Come on over to restitutio.org and find episode 505, The Key of Truth, a monument of Armenian Unitarianism, and leave your feedback there. On our episode from last week, which was about the Byzantine Empire from Constantine to Justinian, with somewhat of a focus on Christological controversies, Mark writes in, and he says, Hi, Sean. Thanks a lot. What a great series it's been. I've learned many new things that will definitely be of help to me in getting to a better understanding of my faith. To many, church history may seem a daunting subject, and as a result, we are often ignorant about it. It is an unfortunate thing, because the only narrative the ordinary churchgoer may ever come across is, as you describe it, a whitewashed one, one of supposedly saintly if not infallible, wise men led by God's Spirit who carefully uncovered and defined the true doctrines of God for the one universal church. 
But the more one looks into what the early church actually looked like, the more one realizes that the stories of the infallible saints are no more true than fairy tales. As you plainly put it, what Holy Spirit? Well, Mark, let me pause you here. There, there are really two main issues that come up with this with, with a church history class uh, related to what you were saying here. One is the whole issue of bias and objectivity and trying to get into the minds of the people you're talking about and describing in a fair way, being somewhat charitable to them, but also at the same time not bending, twisting, putting spin on their actions to make them sound, uh, to, to cover up their flaws or make them sound heroic when in fact they, uh, they had a lot of misbehavior as well. Or on the flip side, to make our own particular heroes, whoever they might be, sound better than they really were. Uh, so that's certainly a big part of it, uh, trying to give a fair representation of people and not making excuses, not saying, oh, well, they were just people of their time. Everybody killed their enemies. And their." Uh, sorry, that's not going to fly when we have the New Testament, when we have the commands of Christ clearly forbidding that sort of behavior in Scripture where it says to love your neighbors and even love your enemies. And then the second issue is really of selection. And this is perhaps even more powerful, although less talked about in church history classes, where teachers will choose to cover certain individuals and not cover others. What church history class? I'd be curious if anybody could find even a single church history class that spends more than one minute on Paul of Samosata or Photinus of Sirmium. I doubt there's a single church history class in any language on the entire planet that does anything more than barely even mention these two individuals. And I think these two individuals are important. I think their contributions are significant. I'd also be curious to hear if any early church history survey uh, does anything more than the barest minimum with the Ebionites, or even mentions the Nazarenes at all. Uh, So I think there's a lot of selection bias. I mean, who even talks about Theodotus or Artemen in their classes? So, yeah, I think that's another big part of it, is trying to bring out some of these obscure individuals whose contributions are important and did hold very significant positions in their own time, and to lessen the emphasis on Augustine or Jerome. You know, I covered them both in one lecture. I mean, there's nobody that does that in a class of this length that would just cram both of those guys in. Many church history classes will cover uh, Jesus and the apostles and then just jump to Augustine. And we did Philo, we did Clement of Alexandria, we did origin at length, right? So a lot of it does have to do with selection, and I, and I selected things very carefully, but at the same time, I am far from perfect. There are plenty of things I left out that I wish I could have gotten to or I wish I knew more about, but it's limited how much research you can do in developing a class. Even though I went kind of crazy on this last class with 22 sessions, there's still so much more that I could have delved into. So uh, back to Mark's comment, he writes, Though one may enthusiastically start one's venture of church history in the first century, as one progresses through the centuries following, one will inevitably develop an ever-growing sad realization that the further one ventures, the less it comes to resemble the study of a church, but rather of some miserable circus. For every decade, the clown show only gets more absurd and farther removed from how it once started. For me personally, this realization, unfortunate as it may be, is yet a great motivator to go peel back all these layers in an attempt to return to an understanding more in line with that of the church of the earliest times. Amen, brother. And sometimes it is a clown show. I mean, it, it is sad. I would prefer to look back on church history and just find heroic examples of stalwart disciples who stood for Christ and his teachings over against whatever came their way, whatever persecution or ideologies, but instead we find a real mix. We have some people that stand up heroically and lots of people who act in very ungodly, very unchristian ways, 
and it's all part of the story. So yeah, it can be depressing, but at the same time, it underscores the restorationist mindset. What do restorationists always say? Back to the Bible. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. So if anything, this church history class that we've just been through has been a defense of returning to Scripture and saying, all right, well, I know that in the 400s, this is what Christians were fighting about and talking about and how they thought about Jesus, but that doesn't hold authority over me because they did a lot of crazy things, and that doesn't mean that that's the right way to do it. Let's go back to Scripture Is it the case that in Scripture, just talking about last week for a moment here, is it the case that in Scripture anybody talks at any length about two natures within Christ? Does anyone talk about his divine nature and his human nature? Does anyone talk about confusing them together, mixing them together, or keeping them separate? Does anybody talk about how many persons Christ is, how many wills does he have? Any of these issues? No, they're not there. And so, why are we overdefining things and saying, well, if you don't agree with my speculative theory about exactly how this whole thing works, then you're not allowed to be in the church anymore, and we may even persecute you. So, yeah, I definitely hear what you're saying here, Mark, and I appreciate you writing in. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that on our website, restitutio.org. We'll be out with another episode next week, and remember, the truth has nothing to fear.